Good morning, everyone. Uh, lovely morning. And this is my, it's my pleasure to host uh, again one of my you know, former teachers and still one of my teachers uh, who I still reach out to once in a while, you know, for advice in uh, everything about life and pathology. So Dr. Randawa is going to be speaking this morning in our Grand Rants on a very interesting topic that, uh, you know, I probably get to say a little bit more about. So Dr. Randawa received his degree um, from the All India Institute of Medical Sciences in 1983. And he followed that with a postdoc research at the University of Miami between 84 and 1987. At the end of that, he started a presidency program at the UPMC, where he has spent all the, his academic career to date. At the completion of his residency in 1999, in 1991, he was appointed an assistant professor in pathology at the UPMC. And he went through the ranks to become a full professor with tenure in 2007. He's currently the director of Transplant Pathology Fellowship Program. Uh, and again, uh, I am one of the graduates of that program. And he's also the past president of the Rena Pathology Society. Dr. Randawa's career is best uh, described as a clinician uh, investigator. He's known internationally as a transplant pathologist, and he has contributed to the development of the BAMF uh, schema for renal transplant pathology and also some of the other uh, organs, including liver transplant. His lab uh, research has a very strong focus on the uh, polyoma BK virus, and actually it was Dr. Randawa that published the very first clinical paper on uh, BK nephropathy in uh, renal transplant uh, many years ago. He um, following this initial discovery uh, of that paper in, of BK virus, he had made so many other advancements and contributions to the epidemiology, the molecular biology, immunology, and pharmacology of the BK virus. And he has received uh, multiple NIH grants, total over $5 million uh, on this uh, topic of BK virus. So a lot of the things that we know about BK virus nephropathy today uh, has uh, Dr. Randawa's signature on it somehow. So he also has special interest in the omics technologies, and we are going to hear something about that uh, this uh, this morning. He's published more than 400 papers, and he has uh, more than 17,000 citations uh, with an average of 39 citations per paper. So he's a well-accomplished, well-renowned, and well-known uh, scientist uh, with a lot of interest uh, in transplant pathology and uh, post-transplant infection. So today, he's going to touch on a topic that has been around for the last 20 years, as far as I know, and I'm not sure we know better today than we did 20 years ago, but I'm really interested in hearing where things stand uh, on the topic of renal transplant histopathology versus tissue transcriptomics, areas of agreement, and disagreement. So welcome, Dr. Randawa. Over to you. Uh, thank you, Dali, so for the generous introduction. Yeah. It was a little bit over the top, but <laughs> I will take it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and mm -hmm. so let me take this moment to say that as one of our most lovable fellows, if you take out your mother, I am the person in the world who is most proud of your accomplishments. Uh, you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. And now this is a, a picture of the University of Pittsburgh, the Cathedral of Learning, as we call it. I don't have any disclosures. This will be the outline of my talk. I will uh, introduce you to the strengths and the limitations of what we now call biopsy-based transcriptomics to distinguish them from urine and plasma and blood assays. And I will discuss its applications to kidney graft dysfunction, various kinds of dysfunction. I'll, I'll be using abbreviations, which hopefully are mostly familiar with the ABMR, antibody mediated rejection, BL, borderline change, TCMR, T cell mediated rejection, V lesions, intimal arthritis, acute tubular injury. If there's time, I might get into implantation biopsies and calcium neural inhibitor toxicity. And to uh, put molecular diagnostics in perspective, we must remember that examining organs is a hierarchical process. Gross evaluation is a key first step. If you don't uh, 
gross an organ properly, you don't slice it, you miss an infarct, you don't put it for molecular analysis, well, no amount of uh, lab testing is going to tell you that tissue is infarcted. And then light microscopy extends our resolution from the naked eye to perhaps about the level of a micron. Electron microscopy brings it down to perhaps 0 0.1 nanometers. And then at that stage, sampling is even more critical. Uh, then we have immunohistochemistry, which allows identification of specific proteins in situ hybridization, will let you detect DNA, RNA molecules. And then come proteomics, genomics, transcriptomics to give you the molecular features of disease. But these features must be correlated with all the upstream findings. They are at the bottom of the ladder. We cannot go in the reverse direction. And uh, I will also stress that there are some indispensable strengths of the good old histologic examination, which are never going to go away. They provide structural context to the molecular findings. They identify, for example, the gross topographic region. If it's a capsular region, you would start thinking of surgical-related subcapsular injury. There are cortical diseases like rejection, medullary diseases like pyelonephritis. Then it's histology that localizes disease to specific micro compartments. Glomerular disease, such as transplant gumbulopathy, tubular interstitial disease, like BKV nephropathy, vascular disease, like graft arteriosclerosis, you have to look at a slide to tell you where the disease is. And histology is also a good way of assessing cumulative damage over years, whereas often a molecular uh, biology tells you a one snap uh, shot in time picture. And then of course, histology tells you what cell type is affected. For example, proximal tubular vacuolization will make you think of calcineurin toxicity. On electron microscopy, subcellular organelles can be examined. For example, dysmorphic mitochondria might cue you into cytophobic toxicity. Histology has particular relevance to transplant pathology because it provides a very quick turnaround. You do a biopsy at 9 o'clock, at 1 o'clock you are ready to uh, look at it. That's hard to beat. It identifies disease with non-viable tissue. If a tissue is infarcted, you're not going to get any molecular findings. It can recognize scars. The mRNA content of a well-developed scar is zero. It allows you to visualize rare lesions. If one out of 10 arteries is affected, you can see that by histology. And then, of course, it permits use of ancillary techniques, special stains, polarization, microscopy, and so on. Uh, yes, there are problems with histology. It can be subjective. It does apply arbitrary rules. A rejection becomes borderline if the tubulite is T1. If you spend 10 minutes on a slide and find a tubule which is T2, it becomes mild. It is semi-quantitative in nature. A disease is quantified in grades 0, 1, 2, 3. These are not continuous. Then there are reproducibility issues. Though I would submit that some of this is really when we create too many categories. Every uh, there is no disagreement usually between mild disease and severe disease, but when you start breaking it up into four or five levels, then you start getting disagreements. And some of the criticism of pathology, such as having a very low kappa score, is really they are mathematical artifacts. For example, if one pathologist says this biopsy has no fibrosis, and another one says it has mild fibrosis, it has no clinical relevance. Uh, but a statistician will say, oh, there's 100% disagreement between these two pathologists. And I would also submit that the kappa lesions that we see in transplant pathology are very comparable to what we see in other diseases like ANCA, IG nephropathy, systemic lupus. We have nobody questions uh, that the role of pathology is despite its suboptimal reproducibility. And of course, there are advantages of molecular profiling. It can potentially allow objective quantitation. Instead of grade 0, 1, 2, 3, you could probably get a number from 1 to 100. And that could be used to uh, quantify the severity of rejection or the magnitude of tubular injury. It interrogates biopsy at a molecular level. We can see biochemical changes, which are not seen at light microscopy. And for example, to tell you how important that is, this person can die of cyanide poisoning. The autopsy may not show anything uh, morphologic, but there are serious biochemical changes. Then molecular biology can identify and quantify tissue repair, development of tolerance. You can develop diagnostic and prognostic classifiers based on thousands of reads. 
and unquestionably molecular techniques have provided mechanistic insights. One of which, to give you an example, is the role of NK cells in antibody mediated rejection. Uh, so there are several technical approaches to biopsy based transcriptomics. You can have reverse transcriptase PCR, RNA seq, there's a random sync and counter system. Most of the literature has been on DNA microarray technology, specifically on the molecular microscope or MMDX, which is also commercially available. So I will focus on that for illustrative purposes. Uh, so the first disease I'm going to take up is antibody-mediated rejection. And the classical study here is the one where they studied 65 ABMR biopsies, 48 were C40 negative, and then they compared them to 338 biopsies with all other diagnoses, including TCL rejection, including mixed rejection, including BK velocity, including everything you can imagine. And that's a less than ideal, you know, comparison. Because in the clinic, we don't say, uh, do you have smallpox or you don't have smallpox? We always try to go into the depth of the disease and try to find out what those diseases are. Then in any case, the top 20 differential uh, express genes were used to build a classifier. And the output of that classifier was 0 to 1, which is really a probability of diagnosing ABMR. And then they set a score of 0 0.2 in the molecular findings. And why did they choose 0 0.2? because they were trying to achieve a 90% concordance with the histologic reading. So the aim of this molecular effort was to co have concordance with histology. But as I will show you, it really failed in that goal. And that tells you the problems with this technique. And what are the basis of some of these problems? To understand that, I will tell you some of the path parameters that were used in training this IBMR classifier. G score of more than zero, glomerulitis, peritubular capillary score of more than one, CG or chronic transplant monopsy score of more than zero were all acceptable for the classifier to weigh the diagnosis to all ABMR. Now, a T cell mediated rejection was ignored. And so many of the cases of mixed rejection will simply be called antibody mediated rejection. Similarly, the BKV nephropathy, there was no BKV nephropathy in the training set designated as such. So it's obvious that any classifier you develop uh, is not going to be able to distinguish between rejection and BK because you didn't teach your machine to distinguish it. And also I will comment that the whole system is based on pathology. And as you know, there are intra-observer disagreements in the scoring of G and CG. And for the low grade changes, those disagreements are substantial, 30 to 40%. And so the machine learning has been benchmarked against low reproducibility lesions. So whatever problems they are with the pathology, they are being carried over. They are not being solved by this technology. And that's something which people don't always point out. Uh, for example, we can have biopsies with peritubular capillaritis score of more than one due to T-cell rejection, BK nephropathy, pyelonephritis, and the use of just PTC greater than one will lead to some overdiagnosis. Uh, in uh, molecular classification of ABMR, then DSA is always carries a positive weight in the classifiers, but we know 30 or 40% of DSAs are transient. And so again, there's a potential for some false positivity to come in. And I'll also point out that C4D negative, DSA negative biopsies have the same profile as C4D positive AB and DSA positive biopsies. They're still called ABMR. And to call something ABMR when there's no antibody, there's no complement, I think it's an overreach. There are many other causes of microvascular inflammation. And so therefore I believe many of the recipient calls, they are molecular false positives, not histology false negatives, although we can have a false negative histology too. Uh, so here's the result of that study, uh, the classifier development study. So the different diagnoses are on the x-axis, C4D positive ABMR, C4D negative ABMR, T-cell rejection, borderline. And here's the ABMR score from 0, 0.0 to 0, uh, to 1.0. So as far as rejection of antibodies is concerned, whether C4D positive or negative, if you use a threshold of 0 0.2, uh, yes, uh, there's a reasonable separation of what's histology ABMR versus what's not histology ABMR. But notice, uh, these histology ABMRs below the threshold, they are about one third of them. 
So one third of histology proven ABMR is not confirmed on molecular analysis. Uh, some of it, I think, is false negative because uh, a biopsy is usually up to maybe 1.5 to 2 centimeters long. Molecular diagnosis on a biopsy are typically done on 3 millimeters of tissue. Hard to believe, but that's what's happening. So it's not hard to imagine that that piece may not have the glomerulitis that the histology is saying. And similarly, we can, as I mentioned, you can have microvascular inflammation, just not due to C4D, not due to DSA. The molecular diagnostic is going to call all that ABMR because that's what the machine learning algorithm was trained to do. As to sum up the molecular performance for ABMR, the specificity was 87%. When you see it, yes, you can believe it. When you don't see it, that you can believe negative predictive value of 94%. But pathologists can do that. Anybody can recognize a normal biopsy. So the important point here was that there was only 67% sensitivity. And the positive predictive value for the molecular diagnostic test was only a 50%. And as I mentioned, some of them are false positive, molecular false positive. And yes, there should we could be some histology false negatives because we may not be recognizing changes at the molecular level uh, by light microscopy. So that's possible. Though, though whether recognizing those changes is clinically relevant is another question. And so I can say very clearly that molecular profiling is never going to replace a biopsy for a diagnosis of ABMR. It's not going to tell you if there's thrombosis, arthritis, severe transparent glomerulopathy. It won't tell you 50% of glomerulus sclerotic or there's advanced fibrosis. It will fail QC parameters if the tissue is infected. It may not generate a signal if there's dense fibrosis. There's not enough data on the other mimics of ABMR. So there's no question. It's never going to replace a biopsy. Uh, the thinking now is can it complement histology in certain aspects? And so the BAM 2017 meeting suggested some scenarios. For example, if the histology is equivocal, the pathology is not sure whether G score is 0 to 1, PTC 0 to 1, maybe molecular might help. Then we see biopsies which are C4D positive. We don't see histologic signs. Some of them have DSA, some of them never have DSA. So maybe molecular diagnostics can help there. Uh, now, in the past several months, I have reviewed uh, quite a few uh, manuscripts which have addressed this issue. And yes, you can get molecular signature of ABMR in about 50% of these biopsies where the histology is not certain. But the bigger question is, do you need to actively intervene on those very early diagnoses? Do those people really need therapies like rituximab or plasmapheresis? Are we dealing really with a borderline component or borderline counterpart of antibody medical rejection? And as we know, borderline changes have been studied for decades, and we still don't have consensus which patients should be treated, whether some should be treated or not. And so I'll remind you, molecular rejection is one level even below borderline. So although all these changes are very good research studies, we absolutely have to do them so that we can enhance our understanding of ABMR in the earliest stages. But the question of whether they deserve active treatment has to be resolved by studies. And those studies are hard to do because the differences are usually minor and you have to follow up the patients for many, many years before you come up with the result. And now in back 2022, uh, we specifically recognized glomerulitis, peritubular capillaritis, which is both C4D negative as well as DSA negative. So there are many other causes of microvascular inflammation. Now in this category, of course, are some technical things like C4D or DSA testing being technically wrong, or it might be a non-HLA antibody. In my opinion, many of these cases are mediated by T-cells because all of these biopsies are plenty of T-cells. And then there's evidence of B-cell involvement, such as plasma cell rich rejection, uh, basic scientists have described innate B cells. They produce autoantibodies to renal tubular cells, which are produced within the graft. And the DSA might be negative in the circulation. Then people are recognizing NK cell mediated injury. Then there's macrophage injury. There's a whole group of basic scientists who are reviewing CD47 and SERP alpha interaction. So there's a large number of diseases which are C4D negative, which are DSA negative. And can molecular diagnostic really detect all these diseases? Well, yes, in some cases it might be useful if there's a technical false negative C4D or a DSA result was wrong, it might point you to the direction, hey, let's check it again. 
Uh, yes, it could be a non-HLA antibody, but I don't believe that's a common cause of graft uh, injury. But molecular diagnostic absolutely cannot address all those other mechanisms that I mentioned, because no such cases were included in the training set for ABMR. And so you expect the ABMR training uh, algorithm to call them all ABMR, because it was never taught to differentiate them. And yes, admittedly, those other possibilities that I mentioned are not common, but they do account for maybe 20% or 30% of uh, the practice in a busy center which has complex cases. Let me skip this uh, so that we can move on to another topic. Let's move on to borderline changes, which imply biopsies which fall short of the criteria for diagnosing grade one TCMR. Uh, yes. Uh, mRNA profiling has a lot of potential in this area. As I mentioned, it can quantify inflammation as a substitute for grades 0, 1, 2, 3. It could theoretically distinguish a quiescent lymphocytic infiltrate from an immunologically active infiltrate. It could require, distinguish an inflammatory response to ischemic injury from alloimmune injury. However, in none of these areas, can molecular diagnostics be currently regarded as a validated tool? Uh, because the studies that you need to validate this use in this context are very difficult to do and have not yet been done. And there are a number of caveats which I want to mention. There are conceptual issues with the use of molecular classifiers. Then there's a sampling problem. And then there's the issue of the precision of molecular diagnostic measurements. So here are some of the conceptual issues. I already mentioned that it starts out with pathology labels. It starts out with pathology scores. So there are those inherent reproducibility issues which have not really been solved. And then the results that you get can vary with the normalization, with the choice of bioinformatic tools. If you apply 10 different algorithms, the number of cases that will get classified as ABMR might be quite different. And they can be different depending on what tools you use. You have to choose. So you can't just use a tool. Whatever choose you, tool you choose, you have to validate it clinically. And those validations are not well done. And then there's circular reasoning, uh, which I will point out uh, numerous times during the talk. And then on some of the thresholds that are set are also arbitrary. They don't have clinical validation. So let's talk of the sampling problem, uh, which is results from the focal nature of pathology lesions. Of course, Histology, which typically exam examines 20 millimeters of tissue and molecular diagnostic, which examines only 3 millimeters, are both subject to sampling problems. But, I mean, it's easy to say that for histology, the problem will be less because the molecular is six or seven times a smaller piece. So to illustrate what I'm trying to say, let's imagine a kidney. As we know, rejection is patchy. So if we mark the areas which are rejecting as gray or and then the rest as light blue, and if you take a two centimeter core, you will see that depending on where you take that core, the amount of tissue that's inflamed will vary from 20% to 100%. And then if from the two centimeter core middle, you take a 0.5 centimeter or three millimeter core, again, the degree of inflammation that you will see in that core will vary. So you can, the calls that we make every day, E-cell mediated rejection, it's a grade, is subject to sampling. And fortunately, it, the sampling problem is only important in the earlier stages of PCMR. Uh, but in later stages, the disease is more diffuse and a biopsy can pick most, but not all of the cases. And that's why clinical correlation is important. If the person is behaving like rejection, the biopsy doesn't show it. Uh, yes, you should treat it empirically. Now, what about the precision of molecular diagnostic measurements? So here is some data on the TCMR classifier score in different biopsy diagnoses, which are on the x-axis. The score is on the y-axis. And you can see, as pointed out by the arrows, there are several samples where the median and the interquartile range uh, vary like from two to five decile range. And of course, there are many biopsies which uh, do not vary a lot, but many of them are actually close to normal. So there, the lack of variation is not important. When there is disease, it is expected, and that's what we see, a small piece taken out of a large kidney will show variation if you measure it repeatedly. And if you go to national talks, 
and even in published literature, there are claims of 99% precision of molecular scores. And some of these claims are based, for example, on correlation coefficients. For example, here's a study where they classified ABMR by two algorithms, uh, support vector machines, and then uh, something called GlimNet. And the, as you can see, the correlation coefficient can be 0.99, even if the scatter in these two techniques is quite different. So instead of just doing correlation coefficients, what we should really be presenting are the median standard deviations or the median on IQR of the molecular scores. And believe it or not, there are not any publications on the molecular microscope which present these scores. They just present the mean uh, to compare groups. Uh, why is that? Because replicate measurements are hard to do. They will double or triple the cost of something that's already expensive. At uh, Pitt, I did do some studies uh, in my own lab and I found uh, three to tenfold variation depending on whether the gene is rare or whether the gene is common. And that's not surprising. We already know that. When you send a tissue or send a blood sample out for, let us say, BKVPCR, you send it to two labs, you can have three to five fold differences. And a, a one rule of the clinical medicine is don't believe a change in BK virus titer unless it's three to five or some even say tenfold range change. So that's an important aspect of molecular uh, measurement. They are not like serum creatinine, where a change from 1.1 to 1.2 is extremely important. And uh, so similarly, you know, there's data on the inter-observer agreement amongst molecular diagnostic experts. And those papers will say, we have 90% agreement, 99% agreement. However, what they are doing is, the molecular analysis is a very complex process. And what they are doing is they are presenting 99% accuracy between experts at the lower end of this chain. In other words, they are not getting into the variation that goes into data generation. But once the data is there, there's no disagreement. And I would submit, you submit an X file of Excel file of gamma-lytis, tubulitis to any pathologist. Once the scores are given, they're going to come to the same diagnosis. It's the generation of scores which generates the difficulty. And we know from oncology as well as kidney transplant studies, that if we include these upstream variables, there are sample misclassification rates of 27 to 49%. And what are these upstream variables? I listed them here. There are many, I can't read them all. They are biological variables, such as clinical heterogeneity within the same label, focal distribution of disease. There's technical variables in RNA extraction, labeling, probe hybridization, and so on. Then there are bioinformatics variables. The results will depend on what algorithm you choose. And in the same papers, which uh, quote 99% accuracy between molecular diagnostic experts, if you study those papers and dive into the supplementary data, you will say that it's not all that rosy. If you get into the borderline cases, the gray zone cases, that's where pathologists differ a lot. What's borderline, what's mild? And the molecular counterpart of that is probability CMR. So in that context, expert one and expert two working together in the same place for many years, they had disagreement rates of 38%. And similarly for suspicious for ABMR or probable ABMR cases, expert one, expert two within the molecular microscope facility, they had disagreement rates of 53%. This data is never actually, you know, presented in public, but it's there. So let's move on to, from borderline to what's definite for T-cell mediated rejection. So I will just summarize the performance of a classifier which they develop along the lines that I just pointed out. The sensitivity of that classifier is about 50%. What does that mean? It means that 50% of the rejections you and I have been diagnosing for the past 30 years, uh, molecular research says, no, that's not TCMR, because we say so. The positive predictive value is 62%. The negative predictive value is high, but that's similar to a pathology read of no TCMR. The overall accuracy is often also presented in a positive way, it's 89%, but this is really driven by the high negative predictive value. So if you have a biopsy series in which only 10% of the biopsies are rejection, 90% are no rejection, well, even a test which is useless at detecting TCMR is going to be right 90% of the time, and it will tell you there's no rejection. 
So another issue that's brought up in commercial presentations is, and they say that molecular microscopes can diagnose rejection in the medulla. The pathologists can't do that. Really? Of course we can diagnose rejection in the medulla. We are just more cautious. We take care that we are not missing BKV nephropathy. We want to make sure we are not misdiagnosing drug resistance interstitial nephritis. And for the record, the molecular micro has not even profiled these diseases. There's no data that it can use it to, for differential diagnosis. And indeed, many centers are reporting false positive MMDX diagnosis for acute pyelonephritis and even galenomatous diseases like tuberculosis. So these diseases are a little bit rare, but we, as physicians, we have to remember the potential causes of false positivity. And so I also wanted to present this slide formally uh, being the discrepancies between histologic and molecular diagnosis, for example, of T-cell mediated rejection. This is a study where all the different biopsy diagnoses are listed on the x-axis and the relative proportions of the molecular calls are listed on the y-axis. For example, red is TCMR and uh, the blue is ABMR. So it'll tell you the relative proportion. This is a complex slide. So what I did was I only sliced out the TCMR portion of it, and I will discuss it next. So as I mentioned, 40 to 50% of histological TCMRs only are recognized as molecular. So what are the causes of this, uh, these uh, you know, negative results? Some of it is definitely sampling. Some of it is, I believe, the threshold for TCMR has been set too high. And some cases are being overdiagnosed as molecular ABMR. The reverse is also true. Uh, I agree. There are cases which histology is not calling uh, TCMR and the molecular microscope is saying it's TCMR. And I believe many of these cases represent biopsies with IFTA. And their pathologists have been lagging behind. They often they completely ignore tubulitis and inflammation in fibrotic areas. They always assume it is secondary, and that's not true. Many, in most of these cases, actually, the fibrosis is the result of unresolved, untreated rejection. And to ignore it does not make sense. And I think this is an area where MNA profiling has helped improve the histologic interpretation. It has helped point out our own blind spots when we look under the microscope. And now I mentioned that the sampling problems can result in difficulties when you are trying to quantify rejection in borderline. So similarly, I have some data which shows you that it's also a problem with TCMR. Focal distribution of TCMR can result in different gene expression profiles depending on which biopsy fragment you analyze. It's only a three millimeter piece out of a long piece. So to delve into that problem, I had five biopsies where inflammation and tubulitis was variable along the length of the core. So, for example, in a biopsy like this, I call this area A, there's hardly any inflammation. And I call this area B, where there's plenty of inflammation. And this area B, I divided into two, one, B1 and B2, uh, so that you can compare the technical accuracy of what you are detecting. And uh, then we subjected it to next generation sequencing, 11 to 18 million leads per region of interest. And this is what we found. This is the principal component analysis of the R log two values of the region of interest associated gene sets. So there were five biopsies. I'm presenting only two to show you what I saw. Let's look at this biopsy S1, sample one. The duplicates B1 and B2 from the inflamed area, they cluster here. The uninflamed area clusters separately. For the second biopsy, I saw the same thing. And so also for all the five biopsies, so you can see how a molecular diagnostician can call TCMR or non-TCMR depending on what fragment is being analyzed. And they often say in public, oh, well, molecular diffusion can correct for all these regional differences, but I don't think they can correct for a difference which is so striking. Uh, this tissue is blue, this tissue is pink. Can diffusion correct for that? I don't think so, because molecular classifiers don't just look at molecules, they also look at the number of molecules and the number of molecules falls off logarithmically as you go away from the inflamed area. So that's just a selling point. It's a huge problem. And so when it's dealing with biopsies like this, I think pathologists who look under the microscope, they have a broader view. They can say, oh, this fragment is inflamed. Let's treat it as rejection. 
Whereas the molecular diagnostic has a view of the world like this frog sitting in the bottom of a well. He will say, I don't see rejection. If the pathology is seeing it, it must be false positive. And now I also mentioned that some of the reasons why molecular diagnostics cannot confirm histology is perhaps they have set up a very high threshold. So I brought out this slide to tell you what uh, threshold means in laboratory medicine. Let's suppose we have 50 biopsies all plotted on the y-axis, x-axis, and then on the y-axis, we have scores generated by one assay, let's say it's histology. And on the other y-axis, we have the scores generated by another X, uh, technique, let's say molecular. So if the histologist sets a mental threshold here, which is arbitrary, of course, uh, then he might say 20 out of these 50 biopsies are borderline. Now the molecular pathologist or molecular diagnostician, if he chooses to set a threshold here, he might come up with a conclusion. Well, out of the 20 you are calling borderline, I think only seven are rejection. And that number seven will change. It can be changed to uh, five, it can be changed to 10, depending on where you move this line up and down. Uh, so molecular asteroids cannot by default be assumed to represent the ground truth. The ground truth has to be determined by clinical validation studies, and those have still not been actually performed. The usual story is, I think this is this because my molecular analysis says it's this, and they forget the variables that go into making these calls. So let me uh, cover some more discrepancies. There are unexpected molecular calls of antibody mediated rejection in biopsies, which you and I call histology T cell mediated rejection. And yes, uh, molecular diagnostics may be more sensitive and may be picking up things which we don't see. But if we are seeing tubulitis and a serious inflammation and the molecular is saying it's ABMR, at the very least, you should acknowledge us and you should say it's a mixed histologic and molecular ABMR. But one of the uh, misconceptions in the field is that these cases just get called ABMR. And although seasoned clinicians know that, they will treat those cases with steroids. But some clinicians will say, it's ABMR, we're not going to give steroids, which is the only treatment that we are now have to get rid of infiltrates. And as I mentioned before, we really don't know whether this level of ABMR detected by only by molecular diagnostics uh, is uh, actually even worth treating. So one more discrepancy I want to mention is the problem of mixed antibody and T-cell rejection. So 15% of histologic T-cell rejections are called mixed by molecular studies. When does the molecular microscope call something mixed? It does so when the TCMR score as well as the ABMR score is above their determined threshold and that threshold is not validated. And by that threshold, the number of mixed rejections they call in large series is very low, is 5 to 15%. In histology, the range of mixed rejection in large medical center series is as high as 63%. As a matter of fact, in Pittsburgh, 90% of our ABMRs have significant inflammation and tubulitis. We call them mixed. And so who is right? The molecules, which say it's 5%, or the others, which say it's as high as 90%. So that, these are really desperate viewpoints, and they have to be resolved by a clinical trial. If the molecular microscope people are saying, well, this 5% is correct, then they have to show that only the 5% that they call mixed response to steroid, that's a very tall order. I suspect when you do those studies, uh, the, the truth will come out somewhere between 5% you know, and 60%. So that, again, illustrates the need for validation studies to make clinical sense. So now, a little bit about molecular diagnosis of chronic active TCMR. Here again, as I mentioned briefly, molecular pathology has helped us recognize the concept. We were ignoring inflammation and tubulitis in scarred areas. And then they study from Scripps Clinics, they took 81 biopsies, which had IFTA, fibrosis tubular atrophy, with acute rejection that was called then they took biopsies with IFTA, where there was inflammation, but rejection was not called. And then they took IFTA biopsies, where there was no inflammation at all. So the IFTA acute rejection biopsies shared 70 to 80% of genes where IFTA inflammation was present, but there was no tubulitis. And yes, these cases behaved as bad as the others in terms of five-year graft loss. So we could conclude, uh, these authors could conclude 
that many biopsies with IFTA inflammation are really chronic active TCMR. We are just not calling them. And so even though the molecular uh, studies help recognize this, paradoxically, this molecular microscope test actually doesn't do a very good job of recognizing chronic TCMR. Uh, Here is I we sent uh, five cases of, uh, uh, I think uh, there's a slide which is a little out of order. Let me see. I'll, I can come back to it later. So here's a study. Here's what the molecular microscope people say. This is a study which was titled Molecular Phenotype of indication biopsies with inflammation in scarred areas. And the conclusion was, IFTA, I IFTA, inflammation in IFTA and indication biopsies reflects parenchymal injury, often with concomitant ABMR, but few with TCMR. So I will argue that they use the TCMR signature, which was defined in non-scarred biopsies, and they are now applying it to IFTA biopsies. They are asking the machine to make predictions based on cases which it was not taught to recognize or not recognize. And scarred biopsies, of course, will have genes over diluted by genes of fibrogenesis, atrophy, arteriosclerosis, tissue remodeling. So if the classifier doesn't behave that well, to me, that's not a surprise. And the fact, so this is a good illustration of how the output of a machine a learning algorithm really reflects the personal opinion of the trainer. If he wants to call a biopsy chronic active TCMR, well, the trainer, the machine can be taught to do that. If he wants to call it ABMR, the machine can be taught to do that. And uh, they often say we did 1,000 goose taps or we did 100 different machine learning ensembles. But if the training is not correct, well, the diagnosis is not necessarily going to be so. And we do have our own experience, a small experience. We sent five biopsies with chronic active TCMR for molecular microscope analysis. And here are the representative results from one of those biopsies. As you know, molecular reports come up with injury scores, ejection scores. And in these five biopsies, the injury scores were higher. But they were high, moderate to extensive. And we did indeed see a lot of damage in the biopsies. The rejection scores were paradoxical. The ABMR scores were very high, as uh, I was mentioned. They do call it that. And all the biopsies were said to have no TCMR. Even though all the biopsies were laden with T cells, all the biopsies had T3 tubulitis. They were not called chronic active TCMR. When you look at individual tubulitis score, even though we saw T3 tubulitis, the tubulitis molecular score was normal. The atrophy score was uh, normal maybe in two or three and normal uh, in uh, the many. And similarly, the arterial highline score also didn't really match the molecular score. And at this stage, I must tell you that these molecular scores for tribulitis, atrophy, hyalinosis, they have not been published in any peer-reviewed literature. The company just created these scores and they started reporting them out in their biopsy material. And when you try to do the correlations, they are only modest. You can see dramatic differences, which you would expect if you're taking only a, a small piece out of a long biopsy, because anybody who looks at the biopsies under the microscope knows tubulitis varies from place to place, inflammation varies from place to place. So now we can cover a little bit of uh, intimal arteritis. There are two kinds. There's uh, the isolated V lesion, which is so-called because the inflammation is almost negligible. I score zero to one, T score of zero to one. And then they are called ITV lesions, where the inflammation as well as the tubulitis score is more than one. So here are the molecular microscope findings in those V lesions, which were labeled histologic TCMR. So the molecular TCMR score of more than 0.1 was seen in 50% of the cases. The molecular ABMR score of 0.2, that's the threshold they have decided to use, was seen in 17% of cases which had arteritis and inflammation and 46% of cases where they had uh, only isolated intimal arteritis. Half of these uh, cases was DSA negative and the C4D status is not known. The treatment data is not presented, but they do mention that these cases which are called molecular ABMR, they did not behave as ABMR in the sense that the patients were doing reasonably well for sh short to intermediate terms of follow-up. 
And then in the biopsies, uh, the same set of biopsies, the molecular call was no rejection in about 33% of the cases, which rose to 43% when they considered only the isolated V lesion. Again, the treatment is not mentioned, but most likely what histologists call intermolar arthritis, most clinicians are going to treat it. That's the pre-mindset, pre-set mindset, you know. And so even though these cases did uh, reasonably well, you could argue, well, they were also treated. They might not have done well if they were not treated. So this again tells you how difficult it is uh, to draw conclusions when you are comparing histology and molecular findings. And the rigorous studies that we need to get real answers have not been done. Now I will mention uh, some of the caveats of analyzing isolated B lesions by molecular classifiers. It's the same story. The molecular classifier for TCMR was trained to look at biopsies like this. They were blue, they had a lot of inflammation and tubulitis. So if to such a classifier, you show a biopsy, which is isolated intermal arteritis, has no inflammation, hardly any tubulitis, just in one artery out of 10, showing this lesion. I mean, you don't expect the machine learning classifier to call it rejection. So the absence of molecular rejection in some of these isolated B cases is a circular argument. The machine learning was not taught to call them TCMR, so it's not calling them TCMR. And also the failure to detect molecular TCMR in many of the biases is the general problem I showed you earlier. Even for any TCMR, molecular TCMR misses or fails to detect about 50% of them. So therefore, it's my belief that if we have a biopsy with intimal arteritis, uh, you should not uh, not treat it because the molecular analysis says, oh, this is not TCMR, this is not ABMR. And so you should go ahead and use your clinical judgment and treat it if after reviewing the biopsy. Uh, now, similarly, there are caveats of analyzing the inflamed arteritis lesions by molecular diagnostics. These biopsies are analyzed and the results are presented as if they were the biblical truth. But it's most likely that in the three millimeter piece that was taken for molecular analysis, they probably didn't even have the arteritis lesion, which was being called by the pathologist. So the molecular findings are really reflective of the background lesion, the background inflammation of TCMR or ABMR. If you really want to understand what's happening in the arteries at the molecular level, at the very least, you have to make sure that the tissue that you sent for molecular analysis actually has the arteritis lesion. And as pathologists, of course, we can do that. And based on immunohistochemical studies, I can say that all arteritis, whether they are associated with TCMR or whether associated with ABMR, they have CD3 positive cells in them. And so at the very least, they are mixed. And certainly 70% of them are antibody. And we should make note of that and make sure the people get treated. But to call them all ABMR is also a problem because you shouldn't be depriving these people of uh, T cell treatments. And in fact, there is no good antibody treatment today, whereas we do have effective uh, T cell treatment. So that's something to remember. Now, let me uh, mention a few other applications of molecular pathology. Let's say quantifying acute tubular injury. Now, about two weeks ago, we in our biopsy conference, we had a case with rising creatinine. It had mild tubular dilatation like this, and I called it acute tubular injury. In the same conference, there was a three-month protocol biopsy. It had stable creatinine. It had a similar you know, dilatation. And the person who was signing it out did not call it acute tubular injury. And I cannot you know, uh, question uh, that problem because it is a fact. You often see severe degrees of acute tubular injury are we can recognize. Milder degrees where there are only a few tubules dilated here, dilated there. We don't know what it means. Some of it may actually be post-transplant injury which hasn't completely dissolved. And when uh, the clinicians ask uh, this patient, in fact, the impression was not even drinking enough water. So is this subclinically acute tubular injury? Well, we don't have the answer to this, but this is where molecular profiling could help. You could uh, get a series of patients where you think clinically there's acute tubular injury and clinically there's not, and see if the gene expression profile is different. And most importantly, see if you can determine a threshold which can be validated and determines the two conditions. But that's, these studies will again be very hard to do. But till that time, we cannot regard it as a, a useful test. Uh, likewise, calcineurin inhibitor toxicity is a diagnostic problem. It can be hard to diagnose. It can present as prolonged graft non-function after living donor transplantation. 
It can present as arterial or highline chain in some redundant controlled hypertension or diabetes. It can present as progressive IFTA in the absence of rejection episodes. And clinicians sometimes have a good sense of what they think is this toxicity. And I've seen people convert it, for example, to tectolomus to Pilatasep uh, for good reasons. I respect those clinical judgments. But it will be nice to have a more objective measure. If, for example, we could diagnose calcineurin inhibitor toxicity by molecular means, at the moment we are not in a position to do that. If we wanted to do that, uh, this is what I think we'll need to do. We will need a set of biopsies which have been clinically adjudicated to represent toxicity. And then one approach would be to quantify those genes in that biopsy which are shown to be upregulated in, let's say, tubular cell cultures exposed to tetralmos cyclosporine. And then we can study the expression of those genes in people who are doing well, such as protocol biopsies and biopsies with clinically adjudicated calcineurin toxicity. And then we can maybe come up with scores and with a lot of clinical validation, we might be able to come up with a test, which is not there yet. And then in this study, we'll also have to study ischemic injury, IFTA, and the rejections to make sure we can still distinguish the two. There are potential applications of mRNA technology uh, to implantation biopsies. Obviously, histology cannot capture aging completely. It cannot capture biochemical injury. Gene expression profiling has the potential to assess regeneration, the potential to develop a cytokine storm after the graft has been implanted. And yes, there was a study by Muller et al., which did the gene expression profiling and then did post-perfusion biopsies within an hour of implantation. And uh, there were some promising results. The uh, living-related donors, which have less ischemic injury, they clustered separately. The disease-related donors caused two clusters, DD1 and DD2. Uh, most of the graft dysfunction was seen in disease donor 2. And so there is potential there for uh, being able to distinguish kidneys destined for graft injury. But again, a lot of work has to be done before we can say that this is something we can introduce into practice. And all this will have to be done pretty fast uh, because the organ donation decisions or organ procurement decisions are taken in hours, not days. So I will like to summarize it so that we can leave a little time for questions. I know Delhi has an important faculty meeting to go to after that. So biopsy-based transcriptomics has great potential for enhancing both the diagnostic and the prognostic tools that we have in our current armamentarium. In fact, these tools have been incorporated into the BAMF 2022 diagnostic schema for antibody-mediated rejection. We believe it has a value which is worth investigating and validating. So at that meeting, there was much less enthusiasm for including this in the TCMR diagnostic schema because we believe, a lot of people are believing, that this molecular signal for TCMR is really a molecular signal for tubular interstitial inflammation. And you can get the false positives in pyelonephritis, drug-induced interstitial nephritis, PKV nephropathy. Uh, definitely, molecular diagnostics has the potential to permit diagnosis long before histologic lesions appear. Uh, but the important question that is still unanswered is, do we want to detect those changes for clinical purposes? It, they may be good, but we may also end up over-treating patients, over-immunosuppressing patients, and that may not be good either. You may give them infections or PTLD. So this illustrates this delicate balance between under and over immunosuppression and the role that molecular and histologic diagnostics can play. They can be complementary, but defining the individual role of each is very difficult to do. And uh, those studies hopefully will be done in the years to come. And then there's a frequently mentioned issue that, oh, these molecular scores are going to solve this problem of scoring lesions, well, I, again, I do not trust the reproducibility data that is out there. It's being oversold. It is definitely not 99% accurate. Can we see score differences which are three to five-fold different? Yes. But I doubt if molecular scores can be able to distinguish, let's say, an I0-T1 biopsy uh, from an I1-T1 biopsy. Just as a molecular test like PCR cannot distinguish a copy number of 500 uh, copies per ml from 1,000 copies per ml. 
And of course, the health economic parameters of what we are trying to do needs to be assessed. We have to make sure that before implementing these tests into clinical practice, they are cost effective. And so I will end you with this picture intended to get you interested in renal art. You can Google pretty nifty stuff these days and put it in your office. And if you buy it from a site called uh, redverbal.com, you can actually make contributions to the Renal Pathology Society. So I'll stop here and uh, invite questions. Wow. Thank you very much uh, for very comprehensive and extensive uh, you know, review and critique of uh, where things stand today. So thank you very much. I, I have a question, but let me see, since we don't have much time, if anybody else has a question or a comment from the audience. Okay. Yeah, so my comment <clears throat> has to do with how the RENA pathology is actually influencing the rest of the solid organ transplant. And a lot of things that we do in liver, it's uh, fashioned af after what is going on in the kidney world. I have, uh, so we are getting there now. I think this upcoming BAMF is actually going to be talking a lot about this. And I have the same concerns that you have. But my concern is this. The molecular things that we look at is based on identifying specific set of gene Recording transcriptions. Recording stopped. So it has to assume so we all know basic immunology that the allo antigen, whether we are dealing with allo or a viral antigen, everything begins on the surface with antigen recognition. So we have to assume that when the T cell receptor is recognized on the surface and starts the cascade of uh, transcription uh, signal to the nucleus, we have to assume that each antigen that is recognized has a different pathway downstream. And I don't think we know that to be true. And I actually think it's not true. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the molecular things we do is making that assumption that I can ignore the antigen that was uh, the specificity of the receptor that started the process and just look at the set of genes that are transcribed. And I think this is what is causing a lot of the discomfort, uh, why you cannot tell rejection from PK virus right. property, oh. for example, because that cascade is not so different. So what do you think? Yeah, so, so there are two aspects to the question. Yeah. So when you, uh, can we mute? Okay, go ahead. Uh, so when you, uh, the gamut of diseases known to mankind is very large. Yeah. And there are diseases which have common pathways. And there are diseases which do not have common pathways. Mm -hmm. And so we have to study both. So as the more studies we do, the more we will understand this. Of course, there's not only one pathway in nature. That's yeah. one extreme. And the other extreme is, oh, they're all the same. It doesn't matter. So the truth lies in between. Mm -hmm. And I think the difficulty between recognizing TCMR from BK nephropathy is actually because they both have a lot of shared pathways. So people who are tried to distinguish them, they say, well, we are seeing the same thing in both. We're seeing the same thing in both, which doesn't mean that there'll be other diseases where the pathways will be different. I mean, Surely you can expect them to be different in anchor disease or recurrent gum nephritis, but there will also be some commonality. Pathways yeah. of T cell recruitment will be common. Pathways of apoptosis will be common. So there'll be, and fibrogenesis, there will be some commonality. So this will be a complexity, some commonality, some lack of commonality, and that's the challenge for the next generation to, you know, dive, yeah. dive into. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, one last question, John. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for that talk. I Early in your talk, you mentioned the concept of NK cell being involved in antibody-mediated rejection. Could you expand on that a little bit yes. and, and how you evaluate that? Yes. So the NK cell is a huge field in itself, and people who are working on it, they have come up with several mechanisms. One mechanism is actually dependent on antibody being present. And that is antibody dependent cytotoxicity. So the target cell will be coated by a donor specific antibody, and the NK cell FC receptor will bind to that, uh, you know, even a globulin, and then directly cause damage, which is complement independent. So these biopsies would be C4D negative. And then there are other mechanisms of NK cell mediated injury. They are actually called missing self. I don't have time to go into them where it's the antibody is not even needed. And those will explain 
the C40 negative, DSA negative microvascular inflammations. Now, if you do immunohistochemical studies, the NK cell population in any rejection is actually very, very sparse. But that doesn't mean that they are ne not necessarily important. They, the molecular signals, they could be amplifying each other. One NK cell could be doing something, and at the molecular level, it could be amplified to levels which are important. So that's something we uh, do actually now acknowledge. A lot of ABMR has NK cell associated signals, but we don't have any NK cell specific drugs. So from a practical point of view, we only have steroids and we have thymocyte globulin. So there's also a need for first understanding all these mechanisms and then targeting drugs to act in the setting of those mechanisms being operative. Thank, thank you. So thank you very much, uh, uh, Pramji. It's very, very interesting. And again, it's so nice seeing you. And hopefully, I don't know nice if I'll see you in Baltimore. Uh, it's nine o'clock now. So thank you, everybody. And I think we can move on to the QAQC presentation now. Thanks. All right. Thank you.